I was 100% convinced that he was going to come find me and murder me. Like, I thought that I was preparing for my own eventual attack. I thought I would come home some days and find my dog dead. I was, like, worried that my boyfriend was going to be attacked. Like, I, I was 100% convinced, like, I needed to take all precautions to protect myself. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Tula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we're chatting with Sarah. Sarah has been stalked for over 10 years by a high school classmate she hardly knew. In 2008, her stalker began harassing her on Facebook, writing her long delusional messages and sending her bizarre hand-drawn pictures. After confessing to Sarah that he has no self-control, he showed up at her workplace to confront her. Sarah fought back and took her stalker to court, building her case to bring him to justice. Sarah, thank you for joining us today. Hi, glad to be here. Why don't you tell us kind of how everything started with the stalking and when you first noticed it? I went to went to high school with my stalker almost 15 years ago now. We graduated almost 15 years ago. Um, he was in my same class. He was he was kind of a dweeb. Like he was like think of you like your stereotypical nerd, and that was him. Like side part, gelled hair, like pleat front khakis. Um, we took a lot of classes together. We were, we shared a lot of honors classes. We shared the same homeroom and, um, I wasn't ever friends with him. Like I didn't really know him. Uh, the stalking didn't actually start until several years after graduation. Um, we, I was in college at the time and I started getting anonymous AOL instant messenger um, messages from some like random screen name. I didn't know who it was. This was like back in the like aim days when it was cool. Um, And I didn't know it was him. Eventually he identified himself and I like, I didn't really know who he was. I was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like I'll chat with you sometime. Um, And this was also during the years of this like dawn of, social media so like private private pages or profiles weren't really a thing so we did there wasn't really a whole lot of awareness around like blocking people or you know keeping your location secret Uh, that wasn't really common Um, I didn't realize that he was engaging with my social media so much Uh, I had a Facebook at the time I had a MySpace I had a blogger um And he, I guess, grew really attached to me through those things. He told me that his obsession started back in high school. He didn't actually start contacting me until I was in college, though. And it was all written, like, Facebook messages, um, emails eventually. And that went on for about four years of him just sending me hundreds of pages of messages, excerpts from the book he was writing all kinds of uh, obsessive letters to me. Were you surprised when you got like the first contact? You were like, I don't even know this guy, but you know, when you first got it, what did you think of it? Um, I honestly, like right now, I think back and it's like, it's really creepy, but at the time I didn't really think much of it. It wasn't that big of a deal to me. I mean, it was just some random high school classmate that sent me letters every once in a while. Uh, I knew that he he had apparently dropped out of college. He got really into like partying and drugs, um, which was really unexpected um, from him. I, I didn't really know much about him, but it was just kind of weird. Um, so I kind of, I really pitied him at the time. Um, that wasn't, I, like, like I said, I, I didn't really think much of it. It was just like, oh, this poor guy has no one to talk to. And it comforts him to just send me messages. And I I hardly ever responded to them. I just kind of ignored them for the most part. When did it start escalating beyond the messages? So it started, it kind of, it grew really slowly. Um, 
at first it was just like friendly messages. He was saying that, you know, I, I told him I, I, you know, I have no interest in you. I'm not romantically, you know, interested in you. At first he said he was okay with that and he seemed to respect it. And I was like, okay, then like, this isn't really an issue if you do respect that. Um, eventually he started, he started disrespecting that and he started saying, you know, I'm never going to get over you. I'm never going to be able to just be your friend. Like we have to be together. At that point, I stopped being friendly because that wasn't working. I thought maybe if I was friendly, he would just like, he would just lose interest and go away. Um, So I tried being friendly. That didn't work. Um, Then I tried being mean. I like, I called him a pathetic loser. I would insult him, insult his life. And that didn't work. He still contacted me and then I ignored him and he still contacted me. And then after a few years of me not talking to him and the messages kept continuing, uh, they started escalating. Like, um, like you asked, like, so this is, that's when it it started getting a little um, worrisome to me when he started getting so desperate that he would send me messages that he would say, I'm searching the internet for porn of you. And um, I was living in Alaska at the time. So he would be like, I'm, I'm selling everything. I'm spending all my money. I'm coming to be with you in Alaska. And then he would send me things like, I think somebody is taping you having sex, like in the bushes somewhere. And I think that there's naked pictures of you online and I'm doing this to protect you. And that's when it started getting like, oh, this is like, this is really uncomfortable. Um, And at that point, I felt like I had to do something rather than just ignoring it. uh, I blocked him from my Facebook after that. That didn't work either, it turns out, because then he, after he was blocked, he contacted, he began contacting uh, my family. He tried to contact one of my aunts through Facebook and he tried to convince her that I would be okay with with her passing on a message to me and he wanted to get through to me I told her you know please ignore it don't you know don't give him the satisfaction just let it go that was the first time I started telling my family about it Um, before that the only people who knew about it were my friends I did have a kind of like a like a a book club because he he wasn't he's not a terrible writer and I'm like I hesitate to say that in like for fear that that I will give him any compliment ever and he'll take it as a positive thing um in his delusion um but his his writing was very poetic so I would send it to my best friend she would send it on to people that was the first time I started letting my family know about it yes though my um because he involved my aunt in it, I eventually told my parents that this was going on as well. How did they react? Uh, they, they encouraged me to get law enforcement involved and to try to start doing something about it. I, at the time, I, I didn't feel like, I, I didn't feel like there was enough, like, evidence for, the, for law enforcement to even do anything about it because it was, all electronic like as far as I knew he was still a like a sane reasonable person at this point um and I didn't really I didn't really know what to do about it either like I I I didn't know there was an option to call the you know law enforcement and say hey somebody's bugging me by sending me messages I thought that they would just dismiss me so we're talking about he started reaching out to you in 2008 And then it kept escalating. And then did he ever take a break throughout that time? Yeah. So he, after I blocked him in 2012, he, there were a few months of a break before he contacted my aunt. Um, I ignored it. There were another few months of a break. And then he, he, I think he showed up to my workplace in Mammoth, California. So I was working up at the ski resort at the time. Um, That was the first time that he contacted me in person. As far as I know, I have never received confirmation that that was actually him. Um, I worked in a ski warehouse, and he uh, showed up apparently when I wasn't there. 
um, my coworkers told me that somebody named Mike had come in looking for me. And it took me a little while to be like, what? Like, I don't, I don't know a Mike. And then I, they described what he looked like. And I was like, oh, I, I think this is the guy. And at the time, I, I rationalized it. And I just told myself, you know, it's like, oh, he was probably just here on a ski, you know, look for a snowboarding trip or something. It's pretty common for people from Los Angeles to go to Mammoth on the weekends. Maybe he just, like, found out I worked there and wanted to stop by and say hi. Luckily, I wasn't there. And like I said, I, I still don't know if that was him that actually showed up. I'm like, I'm pretty positive. Um, after that, I didn't hear from him for about four years. So like four, four and a half years, like there was nothing from him. I thought it was over at that point. So during that time, you had no clue what, what, where his, his whereabouts, what he was up to, anything. It just it was completely done. To this day, I have no idea what he was doing in that time. Yeah, I, I did find out eventually that he did go to Alaska. I don't know if his if his being in Alaska ever overlapped with mine because I went up there for a few summers for seasonal work. Um, but for four years, nothing from him. Yeah, I don't know where he was. So what did you do in that time once he you know, started sending all this information, once he started harassing and then stalking you? Um, where did you put that information, all the stuff that he was sending you, you know, uh, everything on Facebook, all the messages? Um, so I didn't actively save it I probably should have at that point um I, I kind of got lucky with it that it was because everything was electronic it just um I mean I guess my the storage in my email was enough that like I still have messages back in 2008 so they just got forwarded to my gmail from my old college email address so so gmail saved them for me so thanks gmail um for facebook because he was blocked during that time so i found this out too um while he was blocked he doesn't have access to those old messages either they just disappear um if he were to have deleted those messages they would have been deleted because he was blocked he didn't have access to them neither did i um but they were still saved they were somehow archived in, into facebook messages after that four-year-ish break, um, uh, again, like I moved on with my life. I settled here in Colorado. Um, I thought it was over. I just kind of assumed that maybe he got help. Maybe he just moved on with his life. Um, I was pretty heavily involved in an art group here in Colorado. And I had a piece of work up in a gallery show. And I showed up to a gallery opening and there was a man talking to the gallery manager and I didn't know who he was. Uh, I This was 2017. I hadn't seen him since 2005. So it had been 12 years since I had actually like known what he looked like from high school. And he, he looked like a completely different person. He looked like a, I don't know, he like grew a beard, he went bald, he gained weight, like he looked like a bum at this point. So I didn't know who this man was. Um, he introduced himself to me. He said his name was Mike. I shook his hand. I was perfectly pleasant. And um, I, I didn't know who he was. He kept implying that I knew him. And I was like, I, do I, like, do you show work here at the gallery with me? And he was like, no, he had to kind of whisper from high school. I panicked at that point. Um, I like stupidly at the time, like I introduced him to my boyfriend thinking like, oh, maybe if he sees I have a boyfriend now, maybe he, maybe he'll be like, oh, I'll leave her alone. She's, you know, she's, <laughs> she's involved. Now I think back and I'm like, well, that was stupid because now I gave him another target. Um, that was the point at which I, I, I knew like this, this was really serious. Um, after that, I reached out to his sister. I made a police report that night. Um, like I walked from the gallery straight over to the police station a block away, made a police report. And I did contact his sister after that. And I told his sister, you know, hey, your your brother's been harassing me. 
I know that he's had some mental health issues and substance use issues. I was worried at that point because he knew where I was living a thousand miles away from where I grew up. I thought that, like, I, I thought he was going to come into my work and, with a gun. Like, I thought that, it, I, I, like, I just didn't know what to do. So I was like, I wanted to be compassionate and to give his family a chance to do something about this without law enforcement. Law enforcement also told me that they couldn't do anything about it, which was really frustrating. Um, but yeah, at that point, I did reach out to his sister and I said, you know, I, I think your brother needs help. Can you please do something about this? How did she respond? Uh, she responded by saying that him being in Colorado had nothing to do with me, even though he was waiting for me at the gallery, talking to the gallery manager about my piece of work. She was insistent that, like, oh, it was just a coincidence. He's been sober. You know, his family's not worried about him. Um, you know, oh, and he's leaving Colorado this week, so you don't have to worry anymore. And you knew that, obviously, that was not the case, you know, throughout. Oh, I, I 100% knew that. Like, I was, like, I, there was no doubt in my mind at that point that, like, that he was coming after me again, that like, obviously this is just the sheer length of time that he had invested in me was what worried me. And they seemed to think that like, Oh no, because it's been so long. Um, this was all just a big coincidence. Like it was so clear in my mind. And unfortunately my interaction with law enforcement after that incident was really discouraging about like what I could even do about it at that point. And this was a, a pretty clear escalation to me because he had only ever contacted me in like in writing before. And in that writing, he had promised for years, like, oh, I'm not a creep. I would never stalk you in person. Like he identified himself as my stalker for years, but he did promise, oh, I, will ne I would never stalk you in person. And I believed him like I unfortunately I mean I, I looking back it's easy to say that I was naive um, uh, but like I had no reason not to believe him until that point in 2017 when he showed up and he was standing right in front of me what were some of the things where he alluded to himself you know being a stalker or you know seeing mm -hmm. himself as a threat to you a lot of it was pretty delusional rantings and and it was pretty clear that he was having like he could have been having psychotic episodes manic episodes depressive episodes every every letter started off with him saying hey i'm so sorry i'm doing this um i'm so sorry about this like i can't believe i'm doing this to you i was so drunk last time and this is never going to happen again oh but here's uh, these other few paragraphs about like how much I'm in love with you. I'm obsessed with you. I'm writing a book for you. Here's a picture I drew of your face. He also thought that he was the like the smartest man in the world. Like he would call himself a narcissist and he promised me that he would win Nobel prizes. He would say that he was going to like he he thought that he was writing this like world-changing book that would be um, that would win awards and become a bestseller. He thought the same thing about his music too. Like there's definitely this, this element of narcissism in these letters where he was just completely delusional. Um, he, he had a really, like also talked a lot about his like self concepts that he would go back and forth between thinking that he was this like pathetic loser who didn't deserve me and then the next letter he would say, you know, I'm the perfect human, like the two of us are made for each other and we're going to end up together at some point. Like you don't deserve anybody else but me is what he would tell me. And he wrote an album for you, right? Yeah, so this was, this was that music album. Um, he referenced it in his letters in 2012. He apparently there was this book that he was writing. Um, his like his art was kind of his like his like way of peacocking to me. Like that was his way of 
trying to like uh, to win me as a prize. So he thought that if he succeeded at his book, like I would fall in love with him. And then that didn't work. And then he thought that he would write me music and that like I would fall in love with him because of his music. He referenced it in 2012. Uh, he didn't actually put out an album until 2018. So this was after he came to see me at the gallery. I told him to stay away. I contacted his family. He moved back to California. Um, I didn't actually know that he released this the album until last year when he contacted me again. What do you think he was trying to get from you? Oh, well, he was trying to get me to fall in love with him. Like, that was his, like, that was his only goal for the past 16 years, is what he said. That his, like, that I am his destiny. So he, um, I don't know, like, if you look into, like, there's, like, different types of stalkers. Like, he was very much an intimacy-seeking stalker. That he felt like, like, I almost see it as, like, an addiction to me. Like, he... Like, this was the only, like, his, like, phantom connection to me was, like, his only joy in life. So he deluded himself into thinking that, like, this was the only way that he would ever be considered, I don't know, worthy or successful or have any value, I guess. But, yeah, that was definitely his goal was he was trying to get me to fall in love with him. All of his songs were things about... I'm coming to get you. We're going to fall in love and run off into the sunset together. Like every single song that was his theme. So you went to the cops the first time and they told you you couldn't do much. And then you talked to a sister. What happened after that? So, yeah, that, that first time when I made a police report, um, the police didn't get it. They were very much... Like, uh, like, what do you mean? Like, he just showed up? Like, this man hasn't hurt you? Like, he hasn't threatened you? And they just didn't understand that his the mere presence of him here in Colorado was threatening to me. They they didn't understand how stuff like how I would use this term like stalking, and like I never dated this guy. They were insistent that like you must have done something. Like they blamed me for like oh you must have dated him right. Um, they told me at the time that I couldn't do anything unless he hurt me. At, at that point, I remember thinking, like, if that's what it takes to get this taken seriously, like, I will put myself in that situation to be hurt. Like, he's kind of a dweeb. I, I could probably take him. Like, but but still, I um, I was pretty discouraged, even for getting a protective order at that point. They told me, like, oh, well, it's so hard. Like, if he hasn't hurt you, you're probably not going to get one. You have to invite him back to court in order to get a protective order. You need to know how to serve him. So I kind of, my resolve after that point in 2017 was, okay, I'll wait then. Like, I know that he's going to show up again. It's just a matter of time. So I waited, and I waited for two years. And... Uh, the last winter, so the winter of 2018, 2019, I kept thinking that I was going crazy because I kept thinking that I was seeing him around town. And it's a a pretty small town. Like, there's less than 15,000 people here. And, uh, And he's like, he's like a white guy with a beard, which is like every Colorado man. So I thought I was going crazy thinking, like, thinking that I was seeing him around town. One night, again at an art event, I turned around and he was standing right behind me. And I, like, I I didn't recognize him again. And, uh, but something, like, something deep inside me, like, I knew this was him. Like, I, something in my gut told me, get away from this man. And I decided, like, I I wasn't 100% sure it was him, but I decided to treat him like it was. So I said, you know, what are you doing here? He replied, I live here now. I said, you should probably leave. Like, what do you want? And he, um, he said, like, well, why can't we just sit down and talk about this? At that point, it was I was growing in suspicion, like, yeah, I think this is him. 
Um, eventually I said, nope, you just need to leave. He did leave. Um, and I made a police report the next day. Um, and at, at the next day I also found out, like I did some research. I found out, yes, that actually was him. He was living here in my town and, um, and that he had released this music album about me. Like, and my face was on the cover of his music album. One of his drawings that he had made of me, um, years before was his album cover. <laughs> You were able to kind of build up, I'm sure, a lot of this material into something that you could use against him, um, you know, in court, basically. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. And I think that that was why he didn't send his album to me directly. Like, the last direct communication I got from him was um, in 2012, before I blocked him. He released this album um, very widely with my face on the cover. And it was very clearly written as a letter to me. And I think that that was his like workaround of like, hey, like he, I, he knew that I didn't want him contacting me. So this was what he considered his communication to me was writing this album. So at this point I had, uh, like I had had those, like the letters from years ago. I also had this like music album that he had written to me um, a couple times that he had contacted me in person. The second time la- in March of last year, um, I-, I went to the police again. So I actually went, um, before making a police report, I went to my local advocates group. So they work with a lot of women with domestic violence, sexual assault, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and I, I knew them. I often worked with them. So I felt pretty comfortable calling up and saying, like, hey, this is this is a personal thing. Like, I need help, like, with... I, and I don't know... I didn't know what my options were because I didn't know how to get him to stop contacting me when he hadn't even, like... He hadn't laid a finger on me. He hadn't, like... Physically, he hadn't attacked me or hurt me, which was what I found so confusing about this because I knew it was just a matter of time. I just didn't know how, how legally what my, what my power was. So I went to my advocates group that same day they called the detective over and I made a report to the detective um, that day. They didn't, I, they were very supportive eventually. I want to start with that. But when I first told them about the story, they had the same reaction the, as of the first time I made a police report, which was, well, you know, it's not a crime to be creepy. And like, if he didn't hurt you, there's really nothing we could do. If he didn't violate a protective order, there's nothing we could do. And they said the same thing, which was, which is what they, I feel like they always say is, oh, well, you should, you should start collecting evidence. And in my mind, like, I was telling them how much evidence I had. I, ha- I was like, uh, like, I have 10 years of fucking evidence. How much evidence do you need before you take this seriously? And, um, and that day, they gave me all of the paperwork to start for, uh, for a restraining order, for, um, you know, all of the paperwork that I would need for making an official police report. Uh, they didn't, the, I felt like my detective didn't actually take it seriously until I spent an entire weekend. I compiled all of the messages that he had ever sent me. I put them on a flash drive. I went through and I pulled out the most disturbing, um, the, like the most disturbing, uh, like, um, like parts of it, like little excerpts from him. I put it all on a flash drive. I, um, like I listened, to, I had to listen to his music album so that I could transcribe the lyrics for evidence. Um, I downloaded his album. I submitted that into evidence. Um, I submitted it all on a flash drive the, uh, like the very next Monday after he contacted me. Uh, two hours later, the detective called me back and said like, yeah, we're going to go ahead with a, with a stalking charge. Like, turns out this is felony level creepy, which I knew all along, but it took them having like hundreds of pages of evidence before they they agreed with me on that. What were the next steps then once they told you that? Um, oh my gosh, like so much relief on my part that I 
I felt like, oh my, okay, they're, like, they're taking this seriously. Um, my next steps were gathering as much evidence as possible, um, which I became, like, I became obsessed with this. I felt like, I, I felt like I had to do this, like, um, at the time. So I was kind of in limbo with um, my civil protection order. It, the temporary protection order got approved immediately. That was 124 pages long of just my civil protection order. It got approved, and then it, the the court hearing to make it permanent was pending. And then um, the arrest warrant was pending. So I worked with the detective to... Um, to try to figure out where we could get him arrested at. Uh, at the time, like, I didn't know even how to contact him. I didn't know where he worked. I didn't know where he lived. Even for the protection order, I had to, like, they said they couldn't do anything about it until I knew how to contact him. So I had to figure out how to contact him. I, um, I kind of had to do some, like, I had to ask some friends who worked for the ski resort in my town to look him up in the employee system to see if he was an employee there. I got pretty lucky he was an employee and they were able to tell me which department he worked in. And um, so that's how we got him served for the civil protection order. And eventually his workplace worked with my detective to get him arrested. So he showed up to work one day and they were waiting for him, like to take him into custody. My thought process was if I don't put this together and have the most severe outcome the first time, I didn't feel like I would get a second chance. I kind of felt like if I go easy this time, like I have every single time before, then he's going to somehow interpret that as like a invitation to continue his behavior. So I, I read case law. I like, I looked up uh, like our stalking statutes. Like I read about other court cases like I, like I said, I became obsessed with putting this together. I like I cataloged his um, all of his messages from me. I did risk assessments. I tracked down surveillance tapes from my work. Like I did, I felt like I did like so much work in this time period. How did that impact the rest of your life? You know, family, friends, work. You know, at your actual um, job. I. I felt like I was um, I was pretty privileged to have a lot of social support. Um, I was not silent about this. Uh, just about everybody I know has heard this story, um, which which is what I was told. Like, hey, to protect yourself, start telling people. Like, when you're in a public place, like tell everybody around you just in case you start freaking out. That like that he might be there. Like, tell that tell people so that they know too. Um, I was oh God, it's such a it's such a hard it's a hard question to answer because I was like my reaction to that trauma was like to overwork myself to like to put so much energy into this like I spent all of my free time reading about stalking becoming an expert on stalking like understanding the uh, like the mental health aspect of it like what could possibly happen like what are the statistics um like i was reading like stalking like um uh, like scientific research about stalkers like i like i put so much effort into that i lost a lot of sleep um i couldn't sleep i also put a lot of energy into figuring out how to protect myself like, I bought two tasers. I carried around pepper spray. I had a knife in my bra most of, most days. Um, I, I It took a few months. Like, I did, I eventually did seek um, therapy. I, Colorado is pretty cold in that it has a, like, a victim compensation fund. And I was able to get my therapy paid for through that, um, which I was really fortunate and um, thankful for. I was eventually diagnosed with PTSD. Um, it's, and I was fully convinced in the few months after he, after he was arrested, he made bail, he was let out. So he was, um, during like the sentencing, or not the sentencing, but like his, um, the status conferences, like where there were negotiations between his defense and the prosecution. Um, 
I was 100% convinced that he was going to come find me and murder me. Like, I thought that I was preparing for my own eventual attack. Like, I thought I would come home some days and, like, I thought I would find my dog dead. I was, like, worried that my boyfriend was going to be attacked. Like, I, I was 100% convinced, like, I needed to take all precautions to protect myself. What kept you going um, to keep building this, to keep saying, all right, I'm just, I'm going to fight back. This is not something that I'm going to take lightly. Uh, part of it was probably that I kept getting information uh, that stalking cases are not commonly won, that typically um, it's pretty rare to ever get somebody convicted of stalking, apparently, especially in, like, I live in a pretty small town, rural area. Um, The resources that we have here, they pretty much never see cases like this. Even they kept judging my case, uh, comparing it to like comparing it to like what is commonly what they commonly see as stalking, which is like, oh, an ex-boyfriend who won't leave his girlfriend alone after they break up and it'll last for like two weeks. That's what they usually see. They kept I don't think they were trying to actively convince me to kind of give up, but it was kind of like it wasn't very encouraging knowing that like that stalking cases are they're usually just dropped they're that his defense lawyer kept wanting to get it dropped he had he didn't have a criminal record before he was arrested for his first felony and apparently that's really rare too is that you don't usually get charged with a felony on your first offense and you don't so i felt like i kept getting like um told like well like Maybe you should just work with the prosecution to get him a misdemeanor or, you know, maybe this whole thing will just scare him and he'll give up. I was, I didn't want that. Like, I really wanted this. Like, I wanted him to be a felon and I wanted that charge to be stalking. Uh, Luckily in Colorado, stalking is a felony. So that was working in my favor that the the laws in Colorado are pretty, um, a lot more liberal than other states. I, um, I don't know. I, I just, I didn't give up because like I said, I didn't think that I would get a second chance to get to do this. Like if I didn't get the stalking charge first try, have it taken seriously, that it would just continue. And I felt like if I didn't, if I didn't work this hard for myself, like nobody else was going to do it for me. Um, I just really didn't know, I, I, I didn't really know what else to do other than to, like, to do it perfect the first time. Where are things now in your life, and do you know what he's up to at this point? So I, I kept working at this for, um, for months. Uh, they scheduled trial for him because he would... Um, they didn't take the first plea deal we offered, which was like, I think we offered like three years of prison time. Um, they thought that was ridiculous. So they said, great, we're going to trial scheduled trial for January of 2020. So a couple months ago, um, in September, I started working part-time and I dedicated, like pretty much all of my free time to like adding to the evidence. Like I just wanted to chip away at that doubt. Um, and like, I didn't just want to, cause in a trial, the burden of proof that I would, that we would have to prove would be beyond a reasonable doubt. My goal was like, I didn't want to just remove all reasonable doubt. I wanted to remove all doubt, like every single spot of it. I wanted to be so discouraging going into trial that he didn't even want to attempt it. Um, eventually, like uh, going into like going into December, which was kind of when like if we got into December for the pretrial conference, um, that that was his last chance to take like a, a plea deal, I guess. Um, I think at that point I had given them so much evidence that he. I guess he he told the prosecution through his lawyer, like, you know, if you take prison off the table, I'll take whatever plea deal you give me. And that's, and that's when the prosecutor 
called me back in. She she told me this. She said, you know, let's put something together. Maybe if he doesn't want prison, great. Let's put some kind of plea deal together that maybe is worse than prison. Um, so we put together a deal. We threw on an extra charge, too, as a misdemeanor. Um, we gave him jail time. We gave him, um, I think it's five years of probation. He has to do mental health treatment. Um, he has to, like, he has to do volunteer time. He can't use drugs or alcohol, can't commit any other crimes. Um, we put that together. He pled guilty in early December and he was sentenced on Valentine's day of this year. So happy Valentine's day to him. (laughs) He is currently sitting in jail right now and I'm, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to share my story. How do you want to, you know, process and eventually like share your story? What kind of what kind of things are you looking into on that front? Like I studied psychology, I studied human development. A uh, part of my interest in this, I mean, my personal case is teaching people to look for those signs really early on in in how in relationships in general, not just in romantic relationships, but even in like friendships like to know those red flags for where it starts to become like inappropriate uh and so i'm trying to i'm putting together a website right now so that that i could release his letters publicly so i can show people like here's what to look for here's some themes that he kind of got into really early i didn't recognize these themes until i really started to take it seriously over the last year um, but I think that's kind of, that's my, that it's appealing to me to be able to teach other people how to look out for this and how to protect themselves and like what to do when, like when it starts, um, when it starts becoming a problem. So what are these red flags that people should be looking for? Um, so I would highly recommend like the book. Uh, the Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. Uh, I actually like the catalog that I made of his, like some of his themes comes from that. So any kind of things like promises, like that, like any kind of promises, like that he isn't going to do something bad. Like it already shows that he is thinking of doing something bad. So him saying oh, I'm never, I've never thought about stalking you in person. Like, I promise that I won't do this ever. That was a, like, looking back, that was a pretty red flag that, like, oh, he's definitely going to do that. Um, other things like him, him disregarding my, like, my request. So, uh, like, me saying I'm not interested in you and him completely disregarding that and saying, well, I'm still going to stalk you anyway. Like, I'm still in love with you. I'm still going to ask you out, even though I had told him no. That's another red flag. And treating me, like, in some of his language, he would treat me like an object. Like, he would say things like, oh, like, I have done so much work. Like, the world, like, you, you are owed to me by the world because I have earned you. Like this, um, like uh, this entitled reciprocity of some sort. Like, uh, like you need to you need to feel this way about me because I've invested so much emotional like emotional energy in you. That was that was another one of those red flags that I like at the time. Like I I didn't really read into it that much. Looking back now, I see it. <laughs> Once you see these flags and you realize that it's escalating, what's your advice on getting out? getting away from that person reach out to reach out to an advocates group um find those people who who work with domestic violence and who work with like any kind of like assault victim trauma um get that get that emotional support i think that that would be for me i know that that's one of those things that like was a critical turning point um I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the social support like that I had. I I don't know if I like I had tried everything before, like getting help and support from other people was what really gave me the confidence to move forward with this. Um, 
I mean, I know a lot of people, like, especially when it starts going to the courts, like, a lot of the defense often hopes that victims will just lose steam and get exhausted and, like, and not want to not want to go through the emotional burden of having to face, like, face their, the perpetrator, potentially in a trial, like, like having to go up on stand and speak against your, like, um, the perpetrator. Um, that's a lot for people. So I think a lot of people shy away from, shy away from that because they're afraid of putting themselves in that vulnerable situation. Uh, so I would say like, get that support. Those advocates will, they'll prepare you for trial. They will, you know, help you heal. They will help you fill out the paperwork to, to get victims compensation, to go to therapy. (laughs) Um, there was also like my advocates group also put together a healing circle for like for victims. Um, and I found a lot of support in that group too, to kind of talk through like, my emotions, what I was going through. And I think that like having, yeah, having that social support was just a, like, I don't, I don't know that I would have gone through all of this. Like, I I don't know that I would have carried this burden without, without their help. What do you do differently now that you've been stalked and gone through this? I don't even know how to answer that because it's hard to picture my life trajectory without this because I would have like I'd have to go back like I don't know 12 years to answer that question um I might have like I don't know like I career-wise I might be like in a different profession like I changed jobs through all of this um like I they would never admit it but I'm like I lost my job because of my mental health because of my PTSD diagnosis um so I changed jobs I it I mean it's impacted my relationships with like my friends my family um yeah I don't know it's really hard to say like I probably would still like would still have moved around like I was hoping that moving around would prevent this from getting this far it turns out it didn't so like, I probably would have still moved to Colorado. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that. And you're, are, you're planning on visiting him in prison? Or in jail? Um, yeah, so he's in, he's in our local county jail. Uh, we Apparently, going to prison was like, that was like the one thing he didn't want to do. So we took state prison off the table in the plea deal. Uh, yeah, he's in county jail now. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that looks like yet. I'm hoping over the next few weeks to sit down and talk to somebody who specializes in restorative justice. Uh, I, from my point of view, I have not, I have not actually had a conversation with him, like, in person, ever. Like, I've, he's only ever communicated to me in writing, so... I don't know what happened during those four years that he took a break. I don't know, like, anything about his side of the story. Apparently, when, during the sentencing hearing, um, he did, he spoke on his own behalf. Like, I was there. I listened. I heard him. Um, he, He doesn't believe that he did anything wrong at this point. He's still delusional in that this, what he did was not a crime. He just felt like he wouldn't win in trial. Like, so he decided to take the deal, apparently. Um, yeah, I, I would like to talk to him in jail. I kind of just want some, I think I want some clarity on like, why. I don't know that I'm going to get that. I don't know that I'm going to get any kind of, like, a, like a real, uh, not like, sane response from him, but... I think I just want to sit there and like bear witness to like, even if he's completely delusional um, for like, I'd love to know what, like what that is. So the website is called your face is like heroin.com, which is one of the lines that he sent to me was he told me like your face is like heroin. 
so that's I decided to name my website after that. And yeah, and I'm I'll be slowly releasing some of his letters that he wrote to me. Sarah, we can't thank you enough for for joining us today. Um, it's been a really remarkable story, and we thank you tremendously. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I mean, I'm like whatever I can do to like just to promote this cause and to um, to talk about like to talk about this subject and kind of like tell people to take it seriously and to kind of follow your gut. Like I I feel like I got. I got kind of lucky and I felt really privileged that like I only had to make, I only had to make two police reports before I was taken seriously. And I had a lot of support throughout this process. And um, I just, I want to encourage other people who are going through this to, to believe themselves first and to trust their gut in it and to seek that, seek out that support, like to, to really, to get this taken seriously. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources on our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. I'm Jake Diptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking.